This hearing of the Subcommittee on Immigration, Citizenship, Refugees, Border Security, and International Law will come to order. I'd like to welcome the Immigration Subcommittee members, our witnesses, and members of the public who are here today for the Subcommittee's eighth hearing on comprehensive immigration reform. In our hearings on comprehensive in immigration reform, many of our witnesses, both majority and minority, have stated that our immigration system should serve the interests of the nation, and we agree with that. Some, including the Bush administration, have suggested that family-based immigration, as it is currently codified in the immigration law, does not benefit the nation. They assume that family immigrants do not serve the nation because such immigrants come to the United States because of their family ties rather than a demonstrated capacity to contribute economically to our country. They argue that we should eliminate most forms of family-based immigration and replace it with an immigration system that focuses solely on the economic needs of our nation, either through an enhanced employment-based preference system or a point system. Under our current immigration system, 39% of immigrants become legal permanent residents based on their status as unmarried minor children, spouses, or parents of U.S. citizens. Another 19% become legal permanent residents based upon their status as adult sons and daughters or siblings of U.S. citizens or spouses and unmarried children of legal permanent residents. To help us determine whether family-based immigration has, in fact, serve the interests of our nation, today we will examine the role that family-based immigrants have played in our economy and society, particularly since the 1965 Immigration Act, which emphasized the importance of family reunification as a bedrock principle of our immigration system. A review of scholarly research by labor economists and sociologists shows that family immigrants make important and unique contributions to the U.S. economy and society. The research shows that family-based immigrants provide the United States with flexible workers who are willing and able to learn new skills to meet the needs of the U.S. labor market. In addition, research indicates that family-based immigrants contribute to the development of small and large businesses that would not have been created without their presence in the United States. Our witnesses today will also help us to understand the role that families play in fueling the economic prosperity of the U.S. citizen and legal permanent resident family members who sponsor their immigrant petitions. Not only is it an American value and a pro-family value to keep U.S. citizen and legal permanent resident families together, it is in the economic interest of the United States. Thank you again to our distinguished witnesses for being here today to help us sort through a complex and very important issue for the American economy and our society. I would now recognize our distinguished ranking member, minority member, Stephen King, for his opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, uh, the, uh, and also Chairman Conyers, and I appreciate you holding this hearing, and I thank all the witnesses for uh, being willing to be here and, uh, and I'll say present yourselves before this process that we have. Um, as we address our expansive family-based policy, I'm mindful of the fact that many of us in this room are the descendants of immigrants uh, who came to these shores with little or nothing besides their skills and enthusiasm. With much hard work and perseverance, they contributed greatly to the building of this country. We are their success stories. I'd also point out that all nations are nations of immigrants, and the same stories exist in many of the other countries, although we have a, we have a certain spirit here that's exclusive, I believe, to the experience of the rest of the world. Uh, but because we cannot admit all who desire to make America their home, we must make difficult choices. Last year, the United States granted permanent residence to 1,122,000 million, million, excuse me, 1,122,000 aliens, the highest level since 1907. And uh, if you'll remember, 1907, just last month, was, uh, was the centennial anniversary of the highest day at Ellis Island, where 700, and, let's see, and the, the number of 11,747 immigrants were processed through there on that day last month, on the 17th of April. The vast majority of American people have consistently said that they don't want higher immigration levels. In 1965, legislation was passed with the laudable goal of eliminating national origin discrimination from our immigration policy. The 1965 Act made family reunification the cornerstone of our immigration policy. It remains so to this day. In addition to promoting the unity of the nuclear family, the, the 65 Act also extended immigration benefits to other categories of family members, including the sons and daughters of United States citizens who, either because of age or marriage, are no longer dependents. The adult siblings of the United States citizens and the unmarried adult sons and daughters of unlawful permanent residents were also included. In testimony before the Senate Immigration Subcommittee on February 10, 1965, Myra C. Hacker from the New Jersey Coalition urged that 
and I quote, the hidden mathematics of the bill should be made clear to the public so that they may tell their congressmen how they feel about providing jobs, schools, homes, security against want, citizen education, etc., for an inter- indeterminately enormous number of aliens. That was 1965. But at the same hearing, Senator Kennedy reassured the committee that immigration levels after the 65 bill would remain substantially the same. There isn't any basis to defend that statement of Senator Kennedy's today, but he is advocating strongly to do the same thing again in 2007 that he was part of in 1965. Same rationale, and I'll predict the same result if he gets his way. What happened was that an exponentially increasing wave of chain chain migration was set in motion. Through the 70s and 80s, the prior average of 230,000 new immigrants per year more than doubled into the excess into an excess of 500,000. Now, in the 21st century, we're admitting more than a million new immigrants a year, as I said, a million and 122,000 last year, and that's illegal. During these decades, immigration contributed a majority of total U.S. population growth, and more than half of the infrastructure and schools that were built were built to accommodate immigrants. After an extensive study of our family-based immigration scheme, the Barbara Jordan-led U.S. Commission on Immigration Reform concluded in 1995 that it was time to shift our priorities, and they recommended that they focus on uniting the nuclear families and attracting skilled workers. The commission advised, unless there is a compelling national interest to do otherwise, immigrants should be chosen on the, ba- chosen on the basis of the skills they contribute to the U.S. economy. I agree with Barbara Jordan that reuniting a nuclear family with a sponsor who played by the rules and came here the right way is such a compelling national interest. And I agree that bringing in their adult children and siblings is not. Um, In fact, of the entire pie chart of our immigration, we have testimony in prior prior hearings that demonstrates that as much as 89 and perhaps as much as 93% of our immigration, legal immigration, is based on humanitarian reasons, and as little as 7 to 11% is based upon skills or merit. But Numbers USA estimates that the admission of a single lawful permanent resident under our current law can hypothetically lead to the eventual immigration of hundreds of relatives. This lengthy, lengthy chain of migration cannot be justified. While nuclear families should be united, we need to eliminate other family preference categories and refocus our priorities on those who possess the education and skills we need to, competitive, to be competitive in a global economy. We should not reserve so many of our immigrant visas for aliens whose only attribute is that they happen to be related to a U.S. citizen or permanent resident. Last year, 46,923 non-dependent sons and daughters were admitted, along with 63,255 siblings. Another 120,000 slots were given to the parents of the United States citizens. This means that 232,619 of the 803,000 family-based immigrants in 06 were not spouses or minor children, it all, I also submit that if the sibling and adult children uh, categories are eliminated, then justification for an unlimited parent category also diminishes. I recognize that we have good witnesses before this panel. I also recognize that the Honorable Dr. Congressman Gingery is here to talk about the family reunification that has been part of the history and make a recommendation on what he sees would be best in the future. So I will ask unanimous consent to introduce the rest of my testimony into the record so that we may be able to get forward with the testimony of the witnesses, and I yield back. Without objection. Uh, I would now uh, be pleased to recognize the chairman of the full committee, Congressman Conyers, Chairman Conyers, for his opening statement. Thank you, Chairwoman Lofgren. And this dynamic subcommittee that's working so hard, I join in welcoming Dr. Gingry, with whom I have the pleasure of working on a number of issues and seeing him regularly. But, and, and the witnesses too, this, uh, the other witnesses. This is an important part of uh, forming a new uh, immigration reform. Uh, What do we do with the family-based immigration system? Uh, We we have three options. One, we can abandon our system. It would ignore the realities of people's lives and the values of the country. Two, we could maintain it without change. But the problem there is that there are tremendous backlogs that have split families apart under the current system. And 
I think we owe a responsibility to deal with that. Or three, we could improve the family-based immigration system uh, using comprehensive reform to remove those impediments to immigration so that people could come to the United States and join their families through a wide variety of programs. Now, we all know that. We're, we're a nation of immigrants. So th this isn't some new theory that's being developed. We want to build on and improve where we are. Now, while an employment-based system might respond to short-term economic needs, it really undermines the core humanitarian value of family unification. A family-based immigration system isn't just feel good or doing the right thing or being nice. It has a long, it's long been a central tenet of our nation's immigration policy, recognizing immigrants are first and foremost people who are not just motivated because of economic concerns, but also by a desire to take care of their families. And by harnessing that motivation, we can harness all that is good about immigration. And as my friend, the ranking member of this subcommittee, Steve King, has frequently asserted, the family is the backbone of this nation. Couldn't agree with you more, Mr. Ranking Member. Immigrant families have strengthened the country immeasurably, and we should support them. The 1965 immigration law now rejected previous quota systems that had long discriminated against people of color and persons uh, from the developing world, and uh, it was a, a, a dismal a part of our policy and so instead we've moved to a system that supports family unification. Now what do families provide? Stability and values. Uh, the benefits are an immigrant who is in the United States with his wife and children is a stable contributing member of the community. The parents who have their children living with them can better inculcate them with American values in a supportive environment. And they provide the entrepreneurial spirit needed to stimulate economic growth in our communities. And as we will undoubtedly hear from this excellent panel today, family-based immigration promotes, among other positive developments, stimulates the establishment of small businesses. These immigrants often find niches in uh, American uh, economic systems that have not been filled or could not uh, fill because of uh, lack of skills, language, or lack of access to capital. Now, uh, these small businesses revitalize our urban and rural communities, and my hometown is an example of this, uh, where we've got uh, in southeastern Michigan, 383, we went from 383 small Hispanic businesses in 2002 to 955. It's, it's just one example of some of the benefits of family-based immigration, and I uh, yield back the balance of my time. Thank, Thank you, you, Chairman Conyers. In the interest of proceeding to our witnesses and mindful of our schedules, I would ask that other members submit their statements for the record within five legislative days and without objection all opening statements will be placed in the record without objection the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the hearing at any time we have a distinguished panel of witnesses here today to help us consider the important issues before us i'm pleased first to introduce dr harriet duleep a research professor of public policy for the thomas jefferson program in public policy at the college of william and mary dr duleep additionally serves as a research fellow at the Institute for the Study of Labor in Bonn, Germany, and the deputy editor for the publication Demography. Prior to joining the faculty of William & Mary, Dr. Duleep worked as an economist for the Social Security Administration, and between 1985 and 92, served as a senior economist and acting director of the research office of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. 
She holds her bachelor's degree from the University of Michigan and her, her PhD from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. We're also joined today by Bill Ong Hing, a professor of law in Asian American Studies at the University of California, Davis. Professor Hing teaches an array of subjects at Davis, among them courses in immigration policy and judicial processes, and he directs the law school's clinical program. A renowned author, Professor Hing additionally volunteers as a general counsel for the Immigration Legal Resource Center in San Francisco. He sits on the board of directors for the Asian Law Caucus, the Migration Policy Institute, and the National Advisory Council of the Asian American Justice Center. Professor Hing served as co-counsel in the precedent-setting 1987 Supreme Court asylum case, INS versus Cardoza Fonseca. He earned his bachelor's degree from the University of California, Berkeley, and his law degree from the University of San Francisco. Next, I'm pleased to welcome Stuart Anderson, the Executive Director of the National Foundation for American Policy. From 2001 to 2003, Mr. Anderson served as the Executive Associate Commissioner for Policy and Planning and additionally as Counselor to the Commissioner at the U.S. Immigration and Naturalization Service. Mr. Anderson is no stranger to the halls of Congress. He spent nearly five years on Capitol Hill working for the Senate's Immigration Subcommittee, first under Senator Spencer Abraham, and then as staff director under Senator Sam Brownback. He also worked as the Director of Trade and Immigration Studies at the Cato Institute here in Washington. He graduated with a bachelor's degree from Drew University and a master's from Georgetown University. And finally, I would like to extend a warm welcome to a familiar face, Congressman Phil Gingrey of Georgia's 11th Congressional Di District. Dr. Gingrey was elected to the House in 2002 after four years in the Georgia State Senate. He holds his bachelor's degree from Georgia Tech and his medical degree from the Medical College of Georgia. Dr. Gingrey practiced medicine for 26 years as an OBGYN and delivered more than 5,200 babies. He and his wife, Billy, have four children and five grandchildren. As, as Congressman Gingrey knows, each of the written statements will be made part of the record in their entirety. And I would ask that the witnesses summarize uh, their testimony in five minutes or less. These little machines uh, turn yellow when you have one minute to go. And when your time is up, they turn red. And we would ask at that point that you um, summarize and see so the next witness uh, can begin. We'll now proceed to question our witnesses and uh, to uh, hear from our witnesses and uh, at the request of the minority and in deference to um, our colleague, we would ask that Congressman Gingrey uh, uh, begin the testimony. Congressman. Madam Chairwoman, thank you so much and I appreciate uh, the deference uh, in allowing me to go first. Ranking Member King, uh, Committee Chairman Mr. Kanyas and other subcommittee uh, members, uh, friends all, and I thank you for the opportunity to testify today about the role of the family in the immigration process. And as uh, Chairwoman Lofgren stated, uh, my, my full uh, comments will be submitted for the record. And I, and I will just summarize. Uh, the, the chairman uh, of the full committee, uh, Mr. Conyers, was just talking about uh, how important uh, family unification is, how important families are to our society. Uh, and I agree with him completely on that. No question about it. People do come here. Uh, not only to support themselves, but to support their families. Uh, and, and I think we can do that, and I think the bill uh, that I have introduced in this 110th Congress, H.R. Uh, 938, uh, the Nuclear Family, Nuclear Family Priority Act, uh, does just that. Uh, but I think that the, the problem that we have uh, gotten into, and I, and I really believe that this started in in 1965 and the 1965 Act uh, that put an emphasis on family reunification. Uh, in the first uh, 200 years of our country, we averaged about 250,000 uh, immigrants per year uh, into the United States. Uh, and as uh, Ranking Member King uh, pointed out in his uh, opening remarks, uh, in, the, in the last uh, number, I guess in 2006, uh, that had ballooned to over a million, a million 100,000 plus. Uh, and that's, I think, in large part uh, because of this emphasis uh, after 1965 uh, that, that may be overemphasized or maybe even overinterpreted uh, the real definition of family reunification. Uh, and uh, under the current policy, a single person that comes into this country legally 
uh, either by virtue of an, uh, an asylum uh, or refugee or a, uh, a legal permanent residence with a green card who comes in because they've been in the queue for a long time. Uh, they have a particular uh, job skill. Not only can they help themselves, but they can also uh, help our great country. Uh, that when they come, then uh, at, when they achieve citizenship, uh, they are allowed to, to bring family members, but it's not just the nuclear family. It's not just their spouse and their dependent children uh, from their home country. Uh, it, it's not just their parents and maybe their, their spouse's parents, but it includes adult brothers and sisters, siblings. It includes aunts and uncles and cousins and uh, uh, whatever the legal term, Mr. Chairman, is per stirpes. Uh, I think that's used a lot. I don't know how far out that goes, but I do know uh, that, that as a result of that, one person, one person who is in this country legally uh, who deserves that opportunity to be here, uh, in one of these three categories that I mentioned, uh, over a period of as short as 15 years, they can literally bring in an additional 273 people uh, and all these aunts and uncles and cousins and thirds and whatever, 273 people, Mr. Chair, uh, Madam Chairwoman, that uh, who, who may have great job skills, but they may not. And in, in, in statistics, I think, pretty much bear this out that many, many don't. In fact, many... Uh, have very little education uh, and become high school dropouts when, when they come into this country uh, and are not productive and don't have any particular job skills. So when you think about the fact that, that uh, we have a huge problem in this country, uh, and that's called 12 million, uh, undocumented uh, is a euphemism, uh, illegal uh, is the actual fact. Uh, I know uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Gutierrez uh, is working very hard. Uh, trying to solve that problem along with our colleague Jeff Flake and their Strive Act and, and, and a lot of people in both chambers are working very hard to try to deal with that. But, but I think that we can achieve, uh, the, the goal, uh, and really the, the, the spirit of the law as uh, the chairman of the full committee, Mr. Kanye said in regard to the value of families with going back and doing what really we, we intended to do uh, way back uh, when this country uh, welcomed uh, our, our immigrant population and to say that, yes, bring your families, but let's restrict it to the nuclear family. Uh, and instead of 273 people that one individual can bring in over the course of 15 years, we reduce that down to 37 in the extreme. And this would, in the extreme, would mean that each one of those that were eligible to come wanted to come, were still alive, and they came. Uh, I see that uh, that magic uh, red light went went off quicker than I thought it would, but that's got something to do with this southern drawl and slow way of talking, and I'll uh, yield back. I have no further time, but I Thank really you, look Congress forward to your questions. Perhaps we should give additional time to witnesses from the South, but we haven't taken up that rule. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, Dr. Duleep. Ms. Norton. As already been stated by our chairwoman and also indicated by Representative King, a widely shared perspective is that desirable immigrants are those who rapidly adjust to the U.S. labor market. From this perspective, employment-based immigrants are the clear winners. Employment-based immigrants enter the U.S. to fill specific jobs as expressed by an employer's willingness to participate in the labor certification process. By the very nature of their admission, these immigrants have specific skills that are immediately valued in the U.S. labor market. Upon their entry, their earnings are similar to those of U.S. natives of similar schooling and experience, and their earnings growth profiles also resemble those of U.S. natives. If, however, our goal was to devise a policy to attract immigrants who had a high propensity to invest in human capital, that is, who were willing to engage in a lot of training and schooling, then family-based immigration might be a better bet. A key characteristic of recent predominantly family-based immigrants is a high propensity to invest in human capital. This can be seen in their earnings profiles. Earnings growth is a sign that human capital investment is taking place. Family immigrants have very low initial earnings. 
but they also have extremely high earnings growth. In fact, their earnings growth exceeds that of employment-based immigrants and of U.S. natives. Um, so it is the case that they start low, but they also have very high earnings growth. We also find that immigrant earnings patterns that are characterized by low initial earnings and high earnings growth are associated with high rates of schooling, high rates of training, and high rates of occupational change. Now, one reason the high earnings growth is important is that it attenuates concerns about the economic assimilation of these immigrants. They start, yes, they start low, but watch what happens over time. However, a high propensity to invest in human capital yields benefits to the U.S. economy beyond immigrants' own earnings growth. When demand shifts requiring new skills to be learned, immigrants who initially lack U.S. specific skills will be more likely to pursue the new opportunities than will natives or immigrants with highly transferable skills. Employment-based immigrants are already earning what we would expect them to earn on the basis of their schooling and education. So it would be, they're less, they would be unlikely to take a huge pay cut in order to pursue another uh, line of training or another type of career. Yet policies that bring in immigrants lacking immediately transferable skills, such as family-based admission policies, may promote new business formation and new directions in existing businesses by providing a labor supply that is both willing and able to invest in new skills. Thus, family-based admission policies, which bring in immigrants lacking immediately transferable skills, increase the supply of flexible human capital. A labor supply that is willing and able to invest in new skills facilitates innovation and accompanying entrepreneurship. Tailoring immigration to labor shortages is theoretically appealing, but it is extremely difficult to practice. Yet precisely because they lack specific skills that are immediately valued by the U.S. labor market, Family-based immigrants meet labor market needs in an ongoing, flexible fashion that contributes to a vibrant economy, which has been characteristic of the U.S. Family-based policies, as opposed to policies to fill short-term, short-run skill needs, also nurture immigrant entrepreneurship. Empirically, my uh, co-author Mark Regis and I find a high correlation between sibling emissions and immigrant entrepreneurship. Moreover, there is evidence that immigrant communities that are fostered by kinship emissions lead to the development of businesses that would not otherwise exist. Because of their high propensity to invest in human capital and their effect on immigrant entrepreneurship, family-based immigrants pursue or foster employment opportunities that are distinct from the employment opportunities of U.S. natives. This suggests that family-based immigrants may compete less with U.S. workers than employment-based immigrants. And there is some empirical evidence on this. In a study that was done by Elaine Sorensen of the Urban Institute, she finds that immigrants admitted on the basis of occupational skills have a small negative effect on, white, on the earnings of white native males. In contrast, family preference immigrants have a positive effect on native white earnings in employment and a positive effect on native black earnings. Family admissions also fosters permanence. Permanence promotes human capital investment. Why invest in human capital investment if you're not going to stay here? So that, um, is another way that permanence is productive is that historically groups that were permanently attached to the U.S. showed greater intergenerational educational progress than groups that were less attached. From the perspective of increasing intergenerational educational growth, Policies that encourage permanent immigration, such as kinship admissions, should be encouraged. To conclude, beyond the obvious humanitarian benefits of reuniting families, there may be potential economic advantages to family-based immigration. Family-based immigrants, and more generally immigrants that do not have immediately do not have skills that are immediately valued by the U.S. labor market, may benefit the U.S. economy by providing a flexible source of human capital by developing new areas need to wrap up, Dr. Yes, and by promoting permanence, and finally by tempering immigrant native employment competition. Thank you very much. Professor Hing. Thank you, Madam Chair. The, uh, the history of preferring uh, relatives or kinship categories actually goes way beyond uh, before 1965. In fact, part of the National Origins Quota System 
the, the preference was for families in the 1921. Uh, siblings, parents, wives, um, children were all part of the preferences in, in 1921. And so when the 1965 Act eliminated the National Origins Quota System, it really continued the family preference in our immigration laws. So I do want to emphasize that in, in our historical, in the historical context. And um, I also want to, to address the allegation of chain migration today and, um, and, and some of the racial implications behind the uh, proposals to eliminate family categories and some of the benefits. So after 1965, Asians, for example, were not expected to benefit from the 1965 Immigration Act because, in fact, their family would favor people who are here in large numbers, and there were not large number of Asian Americans in the United States in 1965. So slowly, the employment categories and eventually, yes, the family categories were used over time. Um, so today, as we, we know, 90% of the immigrants that come into the United States are family-oriented. And it's rather curious that the attack on families come at a time began at a time in the 1980s when, when Latinos and, and Asians benefit uh, the most from, uh, from these categories. Uh, so the, the, the complaint of being nepotistic, uh, of being uh, uh, vertical as opposed to horizontal, are not new. Uh, and I was privileged in, in 1979 and 1980 to be part of the staff advisory group of the uh, Federal Select Commission on Immigration and Refugee Policy when in fact the family issue was raised again. And uh, one of the members of the Select Commission, Arizona Democratic Senator Dennis DeConcini, responded in this manner. Proposals have been offered to eliminate these family preferences. It's felt by some to be too generous as it refers to horizontal rather than vertical. But to deny that brothers and sisters are an integral part of the family is to impose upon many ethnic groups a narrow concept of family and one that especially discriminates against Italian Americans. We also should stress the rights of U.S. citizens by allowing them to bring their families to America. This view should precede the technical notion that we need certain types of specialists and skilled workers. The Select Commission itself concluded the reunification of families should remain one of the foremost goals of immigration, not only because it's a humane policy, but because bringing families back together contributes to the economic and social welfare of the U.S. Benefits from the unification of immediate relatives are especially true because family unity promotes stability, health, and productivity of family members. We need not place family unification in opposition to economic and employment visas. There's not an inherent tension, as some have claimed. There's only a tension if we place them in, in, in opposition to each other. If instead we view the two systems as complementary ways of achieving and reflecting our goals and values as a society, then we don't have a problem. In other words, if for the sake of argument we use immigration to help our economy, to promote the social welfare of the country, and to promote social family values, then family and employment categories together can meet those goals. The, one of the things that I do want to emphasize is the allegation of, of chain migration. And if, if chain migration were as, as uh, hysterical as some claim, then we would see hundreds and hundreds of people flowing in from one category. But in fact, if you look at the history of how family immigration was used, there are times in, in, in different nations and nationalities' uh, histories where family reunification is completed. That's why when it came shortly after the 1965 Act that European immigration began to ebb. Those decisions are made even today in Asian immigration categories. If you look at the facts, Korean immigration numbers have declined. Chinese immigration numbers have declined. The demand, believe it or not, for Filipino immigration has declined. Those hard decisions of when families remain and which ones stay and which ones go back are made over a period of time and the chain migration that's alleged ends because families make those choices. So finally, I would say that we're about this is a nation of immigrants, but we're, this is a nation that loves to debate immigration policies. 
as we know. And, uh, but when it comes to family, there shouldn't be a debate because this is about family values that we all believe in. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Anderson. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. The Bush administration has circulated a document that proposes ending the ability of U.S. citizens to sponsor their children for immigration if those sons or daughters have reached the age of 21. One way to look at this is at the personal level. I think most members of Congress would agree they would have a difficult time barring the door uh, to their 22-year-old daughter while welcoming the immigration of their 19-year-old son. Under the draft proposal, Americans would also be prohibited from sponsoring a brother or sister for immigration, and there also would place restrictions on the admission of parents of U.S. citizens. In essence, as part of a deal to appeal to critics who say we should not reward illegal immigrants, we would prohibit Americans from sponsoring their own children or other close family members for legal immigration. This should be rejected as a policy option. Some argue that family wait times are too long. This is true. However, the, the fact that there are long wait times simply means that Congress hasn't raised the limits in a very long time. The answer is not to eliminate categories and guarantee that Americans never have a chance uh, to reunite with certain loved ones. Uh, the appropriate solution is to raise the quotas, as the Senate did last year in their bill. It is alleged that eliminating family categories would reduce, quote, chain migration. However, chain migration is a relatively meaningless term because it merely describes what's happened throughout the country's history. Some family members have come, they've succeeded, and then they sponsored other family members. Let's suppose one immigrant arrives and takes six years to become a citizen. They sponsor a sibling with an 11 to 20 year wait. Then that sibling sponsors an adult child with a six to 14 year wait. The time between the arrival of the first immigrant and the third immigrant would be between 29 and 46 years, depending on the country. Not the continuous onslaught that critics allege. And all the immigrants would immigrate under legal quotas that have been established already by Congress. While approximately 58% of U.S. legal immigration in 2005 was family-based, more than half of family immigration was the spouses and children of U.S. citizens, which almost no one has proposed eliminating. Of total U.S. legal immigration in 2005, married and unmarried adult children of U.S. citizens accounted for only 2% each, and siblings of U.S. citizens accounted for only 6%. In place of certain family categories, the administration and others have discussed instituting a Canadian-style point system, which would only admit immigrants who receive enough points based on education and other criteria. Some say a rationale for a point system is to improve the skill level of immigrants. In reality, according to the New Immigrant Survey and the Pew Hispanic Center, the typical legal immigrant already has a higher education level than the typical native. So the rationale for limiting family categories simply isn't there. Family members immigrating to support their U.S. relatives and caring for children and running family-owned businesses are more likely to benefit the United States economically than unattached individuals who achieve a certain number of points based on criteria designed by government bureaucrats. John Tu, president and CEO of California-based Kingston Technology, immigrated to America from Taiwan after being sponsored by his sister. When he sold his company, he gave $100 million to his employees, about 100000 to 300000 each, using the philosophy that he, to treat employees and customers based on Asian family values of trust and loyalty. Jerry Yang, co-founder of Yahoo, one of America's top companies, came to the country at the age of 10. He says Yahoo would not be an American company today if the United States had not welcomed him and his family 30 years ago. U.S. employers want to recruit and hire specific skilled individuals, not skilled people in general. The most effective policy to promote skilled immigration is to exempt from the current quotas employer-sponsored immigrants with a master's degree or higher, in addition, Congress can raise the quotas for H-1B temporary visas and green cards and eliminate per-country limits for employment-based immigration. This is the package of reforms the Senate approved last year when it passed Senator, Senator John Cornyn's skill bill as part of the larger immigration bill, and Congress can simply return to those key reforms made in that bill rather than engage in wholesale reform of the immigration system. Denying U.S. citizens the ability to sponsor adult children, parents, or siblings is both unnecessary and politically divisive. The bill the Senate passed last year raised quotas for both family and employment-based immigration, and Congress can do so again this year. Thank you.
Thank you. Thanks to all of you um, for your testimony. Uh, we will begin our questioning now, and I will uh, start off on that point. I'd like to ask you, Mr. Anderson, if you could comment. Congressman Gingrey has um, described the situation where aunts and cousins immigrate and ending up with 273 people per employment immigrant. Can you comment on, on that? Your mic is not on. Yes, I think the, I think the example um, that I gave is more typical but what happened even under sort of a tight situation in which it would take 29 to, to perhaps 50 years, depending on the country, for even getting from the first to the third immigrant. So um, again, I'm sure Dr. Andrew, um you know, put the numbers out there in good faith. I'm just not sure how you would get numbers of, of that magnitude. And also, any numbers you'd have would have to come in under the quotas that Congress has, has already legislated. So uh, I, I think it's, it's meant to, you know, conjure up. I mean, the whole idea of chain migration, not specifically the example that Congressman gave, is meant to conjure up these, like, you know, hordes of, of, of people, you know, coming into the country one after another, uh, well, what you're really talking about is, is many, many years from going from one to the second to even the third, a third family member. If, uh, you know, as Mr. Hink talked about, even if you, even if there's a decision made to, to, to so, have the so immigration. that that couldn't. Well, I mean, it could happen over time, but Congress currently is controlling that through controlling the numbers per category per per year. Right. There are there are there are particular categories, and again, I I just think the term is 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 you know, gets to be a little misleading. I wonder, Mr. Hing, you have um, uh, testified uh, about the history of this whole situation. The Department of Labor has actually told us, and, and we've received testimony today, that immigrants have a much higher rate of entrepreneurship than native-born Americans, and uh, that a large majority, they say, are, uh, of immigrant-owned businesses in the, in the U.S. are individual proprietorships um, and family proprietorships. I'm wondering whether if we were to accept the immigration's proposal to dramatically reduce the uh, impact or permission of family-based immigration, what would this have an impact on small business development in the United States in your professional judgment? Absolutely, Madam Chair. The, uh, the people that would be prevented from coming in are those that are starting small businesses. And as all of you know, most of the employment creation in the United States is done at the hands of small business owners. And so those that we would be preventing from coming in are the moms and pops and sons and daughters and brothers and sisters who actually represent the spirit of entrepreneurship who go into dilapidated neighborhoods and demonstrate the work ethic that all of us are very proud of. Um, Congressman Gingrey, we do appreciate your willingness to spend time with us. I know all of us have very busy schedules and it is a great gift to us that you would take time out of your schedule to be here. In looking at uh, your testimony, um, I see that it would basically eliminate the ability of United States citizens to petition for their adult children and siblings. And I guess all of us bring to our legislative task our own personal history. I have a 22-year-old son uh, in addition to a 25-year-old daughter. I'm wondering how eliminating my ability as a U.S. citizen to bring my 22-year-old son here is consistent with our sense of family values in America. Madam Chair, in regard to you limiting your ability to do that, certainly uh, your adult, uh, 21, 22, 35-year-old brother or sister who uh, may be from, uh, from your native country and still there, uh, an opportunity to be in the queue to come into this country on a skill-based uh, uh, legal as a legal permanent resident, uh, and and they have that opportunity, and they still have that opportunity. I want to respond uh, to gentleman Mr. Anderson who talked about uh, these hordes of people uh, that Congressman Gingrey referred to, and I want to just for the record, just and, and, and I'll be glad to give uh, Mr. Anderson a copy of this. This is the hordes of people, uh, Mr. Anderson, under the chain migration policy that we that now exists, 
and how the 273 in the extreme over a 15-year pe period get here. Many of them may have great skills, but a lot of them have very little skills. Well, if you'll give that to Mr. Anderson, I'm sure he'd appreciate looking at Somebody may ask him about that. And I see my time has expired. I would just say that in my judgment, turning 21 is not a valid criteria for separating parents from their children, but that's just my opinion. Uh, the ranking member is now recognized for his five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first, I would um, reflect with uh, Congressman Gingrey, 5,200 babies. Um, that would be a baby a week for a century, so you must have been busy some of those weeks. And uh, it's quite an impact on society, and I compliment you for that. Um, I'd ask you... Um, if you could make uh, some some more expansive comments on on the 273, it's my understanding that that actually could be significantly larger, but the spreadsheet just didn't accommodate going beyond this to other generations. And uh, also uh, the the cultural question of I mean, I'd look across at my family, me and the families that I know, my relation. We are scattered all over the country and other places in the world. And we stay in contact through email and a lot of other ways, and we travel and have family reunions get together. That's the American family. The American family is dispersed. And so isn't it reasonable to expect that uh, people that arrive here as immigrants who would assimilate into this culture might adopt those same kind of dispersed family values that we cherish our families, but we also take on our responsibilities and make career decisions accordingly? Well, of course, many of the people that come into this country are uh, Asian uh, immigrants, are uh, immigrants from south of the border, are Latino immigrants, have great family values. There's no question about that. They also tend to have 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 large families. And and, and again, uh, my my uh, feeling, my bill uh, that that I have introduced, HR 938, the Nuclear Family Priority Act, uh, honors that uh, that philosophy. Uh, and I don't agree with my, 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 I don't disagree with my panelists, co-panelists on that. Uh, but, but again, I mean, if you look at this, these numbers in the extreme and the fact that we already have 12 million illegal here, uh, and if each one of them could, uh, by this uh, family reunification policy since 1965, in the extreme, bring in an additional 273. And it does, in fact, Mr. Anderson mentioned that it counts against the quota system, absolutely, so that people waiting in line to come here on skill-based applicants are pushed further and further behind in the queue and may never get to this country to bring their skills here. Thank you, Dr. Gingrey. I'd then turn to Mr. Hing. And uh, you, um, you made a statement that there are racial implications behind getting rid of some of the family reunification. And if we would look across the history of immigration in this country, there have always been, of course, racial implications because people come, and I, and I think we really mean not so much racial implications as we do uh, uh, national origin implications or perhaps ethnic uh, implications. But as people come from different places, obviously they bring with them a certain label that their, that their geographic uh, source has uh, established with and for them and on them. But would it be possible to discuss the kind of policies that are being advocated here, the, the uh, reduction of the amount of family reunification, for example? Could one do that without having racial implications? Well, then how do I do that? Well, the way you do it is by, by indicating that you're not going to eliminate categories that have a substan the, the substantial effect on particular racial groups. Uh, this, that's what but won't it always be? Won't that allegation always be made if we if we change categories, adjust categories, or eliminate them? Aren't there always implications that the allegation can be made by persons such as yourself continually throughout this debate? Or well, can you help us find a way not to? Sure, I'll be happy to. The way you do it is by by having a first come first serve system, and 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 if you're willing to go that way, then then I think that. Okay, but, but I'm interested in putting it on merit so that we right. can have young, skilled, trained people that are going to contribute to this economy for a long time. Now, can we do that without racial implications? Sure we can. We can look at it in two different systems. The way we have now, with, with all due respect to Dr. Gingrey, when he stated that, that labor uh, immigrants are put at the back of the line because families, remember, it's two different systems. The 140,000 visas for the labor and economics are a completely different system. They're handled autonomously. So yeah, you can handle the, the, the labor issue and the employment issue separately as it already is structured and handle the family system separately as it's handled today. Can I ask you to um, just um, present a document to this committee that would outline those thoughts on that? I think that's going to be really instructive for us because there's friction there 
And if there's good, clear policy we can do with avoiding that friction, I think that'd be very constructive. Yeah, I, there's no reason to put those two issues in opposition. Okay. I think, and I'm watching the yellow light here. So I have another question I want to ask you that um, it's pretty much the statement that uh, has been made here by yourself and a number of others that about all who come here, well, I'll say this, all who work in this economy contribute to the GDP. Would you, con would you concede that statement? Sure. And then, and then the, the follow-up to that adults. is, right. uh, because every, every time someone pays a dollar, it gets added. Um, so, and I agree with that. But is there such a thing as non-essential work in this economy? Uh, does it get to the point where some people work so cheaply that people who would otherwise not have someone weed their garden or mow their lawn or trim their trees or do that, wash their windows, things that they would do themselves, um, how large a sector, sector might that be? How large is the non-essential sector of this economy? I think that, that everyone who is paid a minimum wage, a, fair, a minimum wage contributes to the GDP. There's no debating that. As you can see, there's a non-essential sector. Uh, I, I depends on how you define it. Thank you, Mr. Hank. Madam Chair, I yield back. Gentlemen, time has expired. I turn now to our colleague, Mr. Luis Gutierrez, for his five minutes. Thank you very much, Madam Chairwoman. I guess um, we're going to have to have a, at least somewhat of a discussion of the concept of family and how people view family. And I'd just like to ask Congressman Ging Gingry. Um, I have a relative expectation that I live in Chicago and that my parents were in Chicago and that my children are going to be around and so I decide to live there. And this is a decision that I make and I think I'm pretty reflective of a lot of, of immigrant communities that tend to live together and tend to think of even their jobs and where they're going to go. Um, do you see anything fundamentally wrong with that? I don't think there's anything fundamentally wrong with it. I would I would say that taken to the extreme, uh, that uh, it it hurts uh, our our assimilation into our society, and I think it has the potential uh, for hurting uh, that community and that family. How, uh, if how does it hurt our, our? I don't understand how it would hurt our assimilation. My parents only spoke Spanish. Um, I only spoke English. The fact that I was their child actually help them assimilate. I'm actually different than they are, and my children are different than I am. Um, we share some commonalities, but we're actually different in that I had to send my daughter to a special school so she would learn Spanish. Uh, given that my, neither my wife nor I speak Spanish in our households, yet both of her parents spoke Spanish and both of mine did. Um, but we continue to live together. Actually, we have a very rich bilingual tradition. Um, and um, I checked with my daughter, and she told me it was rather expensive at the university to take Spanish classes, and that all her uh, all her friends who come from non-Hispanic families are uh, are taking Spanish classes because they say it's a great thing for the globalization of our economy and our hemispheric uh, uh, traditions in terms of our economy here, because. Um, Mr. King said that it was bad, that, that it would stifle our economy. I really haven't seen it stifle our economy. Um, in Chicago, the second largest tax stream of city tax dollars after Michigan Avenue, the magnificent mile, is 26th Street in the immigrant community, only followed by the Koreans on Lawrence Avenue. So if anything, there are large streams of money coming to the city of Chicago from those immigrant communities, and part of the basis is they live there because their family is there. They have a great tradition of families, um, and so I, I quite don't grasp this thing, this notion, almost as though, well, it's good that people uh, scatter across America. Um, a lot of times people don't want to scatter across America. A lot of times people think it's important that they live together. I mean, we don't live in the same neighborhood, but we live in the same city and the proximity of one to another really gives us a great deal of stability, um, gives us a lot of stability um, because we have obviously a community that we all live in. Um, and I would just like to follow up on the chairwoman Laughlin's point about her children. And I think that in America, Mr. Gingrey, as we look at America, um, more and more we find that our children are coming back to live, not not me, and, and, but children are coming. It's just happening across America. And 
And it's not just anecdotal evidence that my friends still have 27 and 28 and 29 year olds coming back to live with them. The fact is, the concept of family, even in America, is changing. Um, when I left home at 19, I left home. It was a different time. Um, my 19-year-old isn't me when I was 19 years old, nor do I want her to be. Um, it's a different time. I expect that my kids are going to be around a lot longer than I was with my parents and that, indeed, um, I was with them longer than they were with theirs. It's progress uh, in many sense that they stick around longer. So even if we look at America, that is, those of us like you and I that were born here in this country and are native-born citizens, we find that our children stay with us well beyond 21 years of age. And there isn't some kind of, how would I say it, automatic or, I'm trying to think of the word, Mr. Ging Congressman Gingley, but some kind of automatic um, cutoff when they're 21 years of age. They continue to be our children. I've looked at your chart, and I have to tell you that um, in my practice as being a member of Congress, and having a huge immigrant community, um, it take a hundred years before you got to the end of that chart. I'm, I'm serious. It just would take. People come here. They become permanent residents. It takes five years as a permanent resident before they can become a citizen. The backlogs are between a year to two years. So your expectation, even if you did it, would probably be about seven years and then you have to stay there, and then it takes um, uh, five years to become a citizen of the United States. I mean, it takes a while. Um, do you know what the waiting period is on your chart for an American citizen sibling in the Philippines for my brother, a brother or sister? It's 24 years. Um, from Mexico for a brother or sister, it's about 14, 15 years. So even if you carried this thing out, given the caps that we currently have, and I practice this a lot in the office because I was sharing with Mr. Berman. People came up to me when I first got elected to Congress, and they said, well, I'd like to apply for my brother. And I said, well, do it now. In 13 years, their visa will be available for them. I see them now, and they regret the fact they didn't apply for their brother. I mean, it's, just, it's so long. I'm sorry, my time. It is so long, Mr. Gingrey. I assure you that people don't apply for their siblings under this chart because they have no realistic expectation that it's going to happen in the scheme of things in a, in a prudent the, amount of time. The gentleman's Thank time you. has expired. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gohmert. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And I appreciate uh, the witnesses here today. Um, I am, uh, I, one comment that was made earlier about um, you know the United States separating the family, and um, just in fairness, it would seem that whoever it is that decides to leave a family in another country and come to this country would be the one that makes the decision to consciously separate the family. That's, uh, I, I know in this day and time it's good to apparently politically beat up on the United States, but, but I would think that, to be fair, whoever decides to leave the family in the home makes that first decision. Now, one of the things... Uh, the chairwoman had started uh, was a hearing on the immigration service, and I, I think it is uh, is doing an atrocious job of getting uh, applications through their service, and that's something I hope we continue to have hearings on because that's so grossly unfair. Any member of Congress that assists people with visas and and uh, opportunities to come into this country knows. We are talking years, and my friend Mr. Gutierrez uh, makes a good point. I mean, that we're talking years from from so many places. But uh, uh, Dr. Gingry, uh, you and I apologize for being late. You had mentioned the, or, or someone had referred to your mentioning 273 as a chain migration. And uh, knowing you, I know you don't just toss out information lightly. Could you give a basis for getting to that number? Mr. Gomer, yes, I would, I would be happy to do it, uh, Representative Gomer. Th these numbers come from uh, doc Dr. Robert uh, Rector uh, and uh, Numbers USA. Dr. Rector uh, is a fellow at the Heritage Foundation. 
uh, and has uh, published uh, a, a white paper and, and I think uh, soon in book form, The Fiscal Cost of Low-Skilled Households to the United States Taxpayer. Uh, that's where these numbers come from. Uh, I don't have any reason to believe that the, the hordes of people uh, that Mr. Anderson say do not exist uh, indeed do exist. Uh, and, and I'll be glad to share this with all the members of the committee and with my is colleagues. Is that part of the panel. record? That is part of the record. Okay, it is. Uh, and and I also want to say in regard to uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Dulip, Dulip um, I'm sorry, I uh, probably mispronounced Dr. Dulip, I'm sorry, in regard to that. But but talking about the the fact that uh, that the immigrant families are the ones that, that are the small businessmen and women that create the businesses and that, in fact, uh, family reunification policy of bringing people in this country is probably better economically for this country than to bring in skilled workers who are waiting in the queue uh, and sometimes never get here uh, because of all these others that come before them in the queue by virtue of family reunification based not at all on their skill level. Uh, the statistics that Dr. Rector has presented shows that, that so many uh, of these, uh, probably not the family of uh, Representative Gutierrez, but so many of these that come under family reunification are either already high school dropouts or will become high school dropouts. And even if they're working in this country uh, and, and at a decent wage uh, and paying all of their taxes, which many are, uh, they're probably on average, particularly the, the high school dropout category, paying uh, about uh, uh, $10,000, $11,000 worth of uh, state, uh, local, and federal taxes uh, and receiving about $30,000 worth of benefits. So when we start talking about GDP and, and, and contribution to this economy, those are the numbers that you well, have. My time is about out, and I appreciate that. Um, I would just like to point out... Uh, and I know it's not good to generalize with respect to national origin or, or races, but my experience with um, Hispanics in, in Texas and East Texas has been that um, they give me new hope. Um, I've seen over the last 40 years a tremendous breakdown in the family and in people's belief in the God that was founded by our founders, and I find extremely hardworking uh, ethic. Uh, intense uh, loyalty to family and uh, intense loyalty to God, and I think those are three things that have made America great. So I'm hopeful that that will be the strengthening of America uh, by that kind of influx. But I am very concerned that we are encouraging uh, a small element to come in, uh, have children in our hospital, and then start a chain migration of those who are not the most hardworking people. And uh, any, any facts that anyone has to support what we can do to help our neighbors to the south to promote a good, strong middle class, I think, would be the thing to do. But I appreciate y'all's testimony. Gentlemen's time has expired. Mr. Berman, gentleman from California. Dr. Gingri, uh, uh, a a legal immigrant arrives here on May 7, 2000, May 8, 2007. Can you tell me the year that the 273rd member of his family gets here? Representative uh, Berman, if, if these statistics are accurate, and I feel that they are, then that year would be 2023. That's nonsense. Uh, I mean, that's that it is impossible. There is nothing I've read in what you've passed out that would make lead me to to that conclusion. But let's 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 leave it at that. I do want to repeat one point because you said it several times now. Now, standing Professor Hing's point: the people coming here under labor petitions. Do not, we, we authorize a certain number of those visas every year. They do not, they are not dependent on what the backlog is 
or what the petitions are for family-based uh, immigration. They are in a separate they are in a separate line. The country quotas may have impacts, but the but the line is a separate line from the family-based immigration. But I'd like I'd like to ask. Uh, I appreciate very much the testimony. Several of you have had a chance. I feel like. Uh, I don't know about chain migration, but certainly there's been a chain of immigration reform proposals, and at least two of you on the panel I've worked with for a very long time on uh, on these issues. But I, I'd like you to think a little bit outside the box, accepting what you say about the benefits, the values, the economic and uh, studies regarding legal immigrants. I, I think we've had some mix-up here between profiles of people who came here illegally and legal immigrants, but uh, uh, in some earlier comments, but what is going on right now is that some members, very embarrassing, right? Oh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> apologize. Um, we are, we are being told there's a trade-off here. For those of us who want to, who think the present situation with illegal immigration is 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 really a national crisis, and we have to deal with it. And part of dealing with it is finding a way to change the status. That the only realistic and the only sensible policy is to deal with status adjustment for the quote 12 million or however many it. Uh, um, uh, that we are going to have to deal with this whole issue of the existing legal immigration system, the quote, problem of chain migration. Can you, off the top of your heads, or given thought you've already given to this, create a system of points? That, that deals with skills and education and family relationships uh, in such a fashion that still maintains many of the strengths of the family-based system of immigration, but turns it into a context of, of, of a point system that uh, might be give us something to work with uh, as we're faced with a choice of either uh, thinking about revising legal immigration or walking away for one more time with the problem of dealing with, in a sensible, comprehensive fashion, uh, the issue of uh, uh, comprehensive immigration reform. Do any of you have any thoughts of, of fundamental adjustments that we made in the present legal structure of, of immigration and a conversion to a point system that, that could that could be less devastating uh, to the strengths of the current system, uh, uh, and would you share them with us? Um, one idea would be to follow part of the path of Canada, um, which is to, they've essentially done away with these occupational skills categories where they're, you're filling specific gaps, and to reward education per se. Um, I feel a little bit uncomfortable with what is more valuable to the U.S., a highly educated or a poorly educated person. As somebody, do we need another highly educated doctor, or is, is it useful to the economy to have somebody who helps take care of my children so that I can work? So I feel, but given the concern about education levels, that would be an alternative path. And uh, actually with the Canada, if you compare the Canadian system with the U.S. system, um, before they made this change, they had a system that was heavily based on occupational skills, and there was no, we could find no effect on education levels between comparing the U.S. and Canada. The, the so, gentleman's time has expired, so if each member could very quickly answer, we're making up for cell phone time here. Well, we, we actually sort of have a point system right now. That's one way of looking at it, is that we actually give extra points to certain relatives and extra points to certain people with certain job skills. So, you know, if, if you're going to define it as a point system, then I would retain a very similar structure in terms of, of how much credit you get for certain kinds of relatives. Right. Right. I would say 
again, yes, you would have to give a lot of points for the family. Ironically, then you would actually have this competition between between family employment. But I would say is that is that businesses are not, you know, U.S. high tech companies and others are not clamoring in any way or not asking to have this type of point system. I mean, they want to be able to hire specific skilled people. I mean, so it's really not clear to me that it's economically beneficial it, really in any way to, to just have a lot of, you know, moderately or above average skilled people who are individually coming into the country seeking jobs. I mean, companies want to hire specific skilled people. So if anyone's in favor of of, of helping this and they're concerned about, about skilled immigrants, they should be in favor of, of what uh, Senator Cornyn and, and, and others have, have talked about in terms of, you know, increasing the employment-based quotas on their own. Congressman King. Well, just to uh, try to answer it quickly, I want to refer back to what uh, the comments Mr. Berman made in regard to counting against the quota system. On, on the family reunification, uh, spouses and dependent children do not count. But when we get into, and I agree, Mr. Berman, this is the extreme situation, and you say it will never happen. But in 1986, when we had 4 million uh, amnesty program, uh, we never thought that uh, 25 years later we would have 12 million that came in illegally, and that is what can happen in, in the extreme as well. But the chain migration is a, a, is a criticism of the legal immigration system. It's not about the issue of illegal immigrants. Comprehensive immigration reform is trying to fix that. I've, I've more than exceeded my the, the gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Gallagher. The gentleman from California, Mr. Lundgren, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much. Um, I don't think this is a, a, an easy issue or an easy question or series of questions to answer, frankly. Um, and I started working on this issue back in 1979, uh, shortly after we went to the new or uh, the new vision of our. Um, overall immigration policy, but, but, but let me just ask this. I happen to be one who has supported family uh, unification as a major element of our immigration policy, but I don't think really that's the question. The question here is how far do you extend family preference? And I'm sorry I was not here to, to hear all of your testimony, but I'd just like to ask each of you this. What is inconsistent with believing in family reunification in terms of the nuclear family, but making a decision that um, family preference immigration as we see it, I would say other than spouses, um, ought not to be limited? I mean, it, it seems to me when I hear from, from people, uh, they seem to sense that, yeah, it makes sense to have immediate family, but the, as they see it, extended family in terms of family preference um, is, is going out too far. Uh, and I'd just like the four of you to, to respond to that, please, because that, that's what I hear from, from people, and that's the sense I have. And when I look at what has been suggested of the negotiations with the Senate, what the administration is talking about, they're talking about uh, making changes in the area of um, family preference as opposed to immediate relatives. Um, well, I would uh, remind um, everybody... Use the mic, please. Oh, sorry. I remind everybody of the point that Dr. Hing made, that in sense, when we look historically, there were not restrictions. And why are these restrictions being brought up now? That's one thing to keep in mind. Um, but also, um, other families... Could, could I just respond to that? I mean, look, we've got millions of people who want to come to the United States. So when we make one judgment here that is positive for somebody, that's necessarily a negative judgment for somebody else in terms of, of who all gets in. So I, I suppose one of the questions is, should the family preference beyond immediate relatives be the overriding principle behind our immigration policy when we've got to realize, yes, those folks are getting in, but that presumably means other folks are further down the line. 
Well, two things. One, uh, siblings, for instance, do have an economic advantage. It's a very the effect of siblings on um, immigrant self-employment is larger than any other variable, including education. Secondly, there's, as we've been trying to state, that there's not really a, there doesn't need to be a conflict between these two, but there can be unintended consequences. One of the interesting findings we found from our research is that there's, um, that people come in on the basis of occupational skills and people come in as siblings have a positive effect on education. And what's happening is that people come in on occupational skills and bring in their siblings. If you make the U.S. unattractive in terms of that people cannot have their families here, you may have an inadvertent effect that was unanticipated. I didn't say can't have their families here. We're talking about extended no, but, families. No, but you mean siblings. Um, yeah, I, I think, Congressman, this is partially a debate over what the nuclear family is. And, and uh, you know, I and many other people include it to define people, children that are above the age of 21, and, uh, and brothers and sisters. I had a debate with an immigration judge that you may know in San Francisco that retired a few years ago, Monroe Kroll, over this very issue. And, but, and he, he, after our conversation, he realized, you know what, I, I, I see what you're talking about because I like my sister. She lives in New York, but if she lived in a, a, across an international boundary, I'd, I'd feel differently. And so that's partly what the debate is. And, and um, I think that we ought to resolve it in favor of an expand not an expansion, but recognizing nuclear family to include siblings and adult sons and daughters. Well, in the work uh, done by Dr. Dulep and you found that Canadian immigrants are younger and more language proficient than the U.S. counterparts, then you go on to say these advantages do not translate into superior earnings power. Um, what about language proficiency? Is that irrelevant to... Uh, Overall impact of immigration? Um, it, it appeared to be irrelevant comparing Canada with the U.S. Um, we also find that English language proficiency, over time, the earnings profiles are very high, so somebody will have an, uh, an initial disadvantage, but that disadvantage disappears over time. I, I would say that, that what uh, Mr. Hingis talked about, there is a little bit of a cultural issue here where, where I think a lot of ethnic families do consider their brothers and sisters, and certainly, you know, children over 21, a real integral part of their families as well as their parents. Um, I also say the numbers really aren't that large. I mean, when you're looking at the married and unmarried adult adult, adult children of U.S. citizens, you're only talking about 2% each of the whole U.S. legal immigration system. And for siblings, it's only 6%. And again, it's not really um, mutually exclusive to increase employment-based uh, immigration. In fact, I hope everyone who's been criticizing family immigration will be will come out strongly in favor of employment-based immigration, since that seems to be the implicit argument. And, and again, companies are interested in hiring specific skilled people. Uh, I'm, I'm actually I'm a little concerned. I don't really understand why the administration has decided to come out, or at least in, in theory, maybe coming out to to favoring really a much more bureaucratic approach <laughs> rather than you know something that's more family-based or employment-centered. We don't want to cut off Congressman Gingrey for a quick response. Madam Chair, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Well, I just want to point out that my youngest child, my adult child, uh, lives in New York. She could just as easily live in France or in Mexico. I would see her just as often. She is just as much an integral part of my family. She doesn't have to live in this country necessarily to be there. Uh, uh, the doctor on the, uh, at the beginning said, uh, why did we bring up uh, these restrictions now? What's the big problem? Well, I'll tell you, the answer to that is we had 250,000 immigrants in 1976. We have a million 100,000 in 2006. That is the problem. The gentleman's time has expired, and I would note that sometimes I feel the same way about my 22-year-old and how often I see him. But um, I would uh, recognize the gentlelady from uh, Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee, for her five minutes. Uh, I thank the chairwoman very much, and uh, we're building blocks uh, in terms of the hearings that we're having, and um, I'm appreciative of uh, this one uh, as we uh, pursue this question of family reunification. Uh, and I do want to acknowledge uh, the work of the Honorable Barbara Jordan, uh, one of the predecessors of my particular district, the 18th Congressional District uh, of, um, of Texas, and I got to know uh, Congresswoman Jordan, and I know that 
uh, this report that she did in a series of reports to U.S. Commission on Immigration Reform um, was certainly one that she uh, exhibited a great deal of uh, commitment and a great deal of uh, passion and a great deal of hard work. And I think it's important as we quote from her and utilize some of her works, there are some points of this I agree with and some I do not. Uh, but I do think it's important that she started out by making it known that we're a nation of immigrants uh, committed to the rule of law uh, and as well that the commission that she chaired believed that legal immigration has strengthened the country and that it continues to do so. We here today are trying to find a way to construct uh, an effective legal immigration system uh, to work with those who have come to this uh, nation for a variety of reasons. Some of them uh, include economic. Uh, but also uh, come uh, for reasons um, of fleeing persecution uh, and also fleeing from uh, the devastation of countries that they have come from. As I read her report, the Commission was sympathetic to that. They had a, a variety of proposals uh, that uh, included uh, concerns about visa overstaying, uh, concerns about how you do employer verification. But at the same time, I think it's important to note there was a sense of compassion. Uh, this commission rejected the concept of amnesty, uh, and I am very glad to say that no matter how our uh, opponents try to construct uh, the majority's position, and when I say the majority, the majority on both sides of the aisle that form the majority who want comprehensive immigration reform, uh, it is not amnesty. So we build upon that to say that if we are to put a legal construct in place, then are we to penalize uh, the legal system uh, against those who would engage in that system to be able to reunite with their families. That, that is the, the real question before us, and I do want to put before us um, a uh, New York Times uh, editorial, May 4, 2007, that had a quote from the president when he was running for office, George W. Bush running for president, uh, and he would always give an answer, or here's a particular quote that was given, family values do not stop at the Rio Grande. And I realize that, um, as my good friend, uh, Congressman Gingrey, Dr. Gingrey, has indicated, all of us could get on airplanes and, and visit relatives wherever they might be. But uh, the points have been made uh, that uh, family reunification is not easy. Uh, it has not been a, a pathway of um, uh, celebration and balloons and uh, file one today and, and you're in tomorrow. It's a tedious, long uh, effort. I remember. Uh, going to Chicago with Chairman Hyde at a point where we had literally collapsed in terms of the overworking of the immigration system. People who were attempting to uh, achieve status legally were surrounding immigration uh, offices around and around and around and around. It got to a point where the chairman of the full judiciary committee at that time did a steel hearing uh, to confront the crisis that we were facing. So I guess, uh, Ms. Uh, Dooley, you mentioned the word uh, historical, um, that we had, did not have a history of denying family. Could you just very quickly recount that history for us, uh, very quickly? Um, well, the history, we, we did have a, a history of denying families, but, um, families from particular regions starting in the early 1920s. Um, the National Origins um, Act was one where people could come in, and it was who could come in was based on the percentage distribution of the population by various demographic groups. So, so when did we change? We changed, and well, then we got rid of that in 1965. We got rid of that to go to the family, more of a family admission. And we, you believe the basis of moving or changing was that we found that that harsh process was not effective or was not humane, or what was the basis of changing it? I think that it was not humane. And that so we made a, a considered... Uh, a decision based upon past history. Yes. Uh, Dr. Gingry, I noticed that your, um, is this your bill, the nuclear family bill? Uh, yes, it is. And it, it yes. limits, it limits uh, to the immediate family. And I guess my uh, question to you uh, would be, um, would this be forever and ever, or would it be until the time that we get a construct in place that we have a legal immigration process? Because I think to deny and put this structure of a nuclear family, of which many of us don't come from, would be a serious concern. So are you putting a sunset on this, or is this forever and ever and ever? 
Congresswoman Jackson Lee, there is no sunset on this in response to your question, but let me just say, and, and this is quoting from your predecessor, the late and great Congresswoman Barbara Jordan, and she says, and it is urged that nuclear family members, spouses, and minor children become the sole family-based priority. Uh, th those are the words of, uh, of Congresswoman uh, Barbara Jordan. Uh, and, I, and I could go on and quote the commission, but, but no. no if I may just finish one sentence, Madam Chair, as I started out, let me say that there are many things that the Honorable Barbara Jordan has mentioned. Many of them I agree with. Others, I believe, in times have changed, and we're now looking to answer her concerns, which is a legal construct that is humane and is legal for the immigrants that are here in this country. I yield back. Uh, thank you. The general lady's time has expired. Before calling on my colleagues from California, I will note that there are currently limitations on unmarried sons or daughters and to 23,400 visas a year. So it, that is the number a year. And, and I was just telling Mr. King that if you have an unmarried son or daughter to visit a U.S. citizen 99 times out of 100, they will not get a visitor's visa as an unmarried child because of the intent to reside burden. But I would call on Ms. Uh, Ms. Waters for her five minutes. Thank you very much, Madam Chairwoman. I um, first want to thank you for uh, the intensive work that you're doing uh, to help us uh, get to immigration reform. And I appreciate all of the hearings that you're holding. I was particularly interested in this one, not so much from the examination of the White House proposal. Uh, I'm still focused on uh, those undocumented uh, elderly uh, mothers, fathers, grandmothers, and grandfathers that are in the United States now <clears throat> who are um, increasingly feeling at risk. Uh, and I'm worried about the separation of, of these um, parents and grandparents from their children and grandchildren uh, with the um, emphasis on deportation that we see all around the country, and we'll get to that. Uh, I don't have a lot to say about this White House proposal except that I just disagree with it. I, um, I'm from a, fa a huge family. I have 12 brothers and sisters, and... Um, I have strong family values. We don't run around politicizing them and uh, using them as a way to get elected to office. But we're just people who have strong family values. And uh, we don't consider unmarried 21-year-olds so adult that somehow they don't need us uh, and that they're on their own. And no, our family values have not changed because of technology. Uh, no, uh, many of our family members would not be able to pick up and run to another country uh, to see our uh, so-called adult children. And so I just think that the Bush administration proposal uh, certainly um, undermines fam family values, and it's harsh. In addition to the elimination of so-called unmarried adult children, of both the USCs and the LPRs, um, this business of requiring new applicants from all of those currently waiting in the backlog with an additional fee of $500 per person, some of these people have been waiting in line for years. Why would we do that to them? That is so unkind. Uh, and to nullify the applications of those who applied after 2004, 2007, people who have been waiting in line even for just three years or two years, knowing how long it takes, um, as it has been described here today, where people have been waiting 10, 12, 13, 14, 15 years, this is the most unkind, um, non-family valued proposal that could ever be produced. And I'm hoping that it will be soundly rejected uh, by this Congress because I don't think that anybody um, who holds family values dear uh, could support something like this. Uh, now having said that, I look forward to some protection for the longtime residents who happen to be undocumented. Um, and to my colleague uh, from Texas who said that uh, the folks who left 
are the ones who should be uh, accused of not having the strong family values. I would just well, say that you know the General Lady Gill, that's not what I said. Well, okay, I'm sorry. Maybe I mischaracterized what you said. You said don't blame it on the United States. Blame it on those who separated from their families and came here. Is that correctly stated? So that's who separated from the family. Okay. Made that they family. separated. Don't but blame I it on But I certainly them. didn't say that. Okay. Yet. The, the, the gentle lady controls the time. Yes. Uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm modifying because I want to be sure that I understood what you said. You said don't blame it on the United States. They are the ones who separated uh, from their families. And, of course, we don't have to rehash uh, the fact that people do seek a better way of life. That poverty will do that. That hunger will do that. Uh, people who are watching their babies die from lack of medicine, lack of food, etc. Yes, they will seek a better way of life. And unfortunately, many of them did that. And many of them have been here now for 35 and 40, 50 years. They have children who were born here. And I'm worried about the deportation and the separation of families. And why, again, do I worry about this so much? Uh, aside from having strong family values, I am an African-American woman who come from slaves, where families were separated for economic reasons, where children were sold off, where relatives were sent to different parts of the world. And so I feel very strongly about this. And I want to thank the chair lady for her sensitivity and her uh, focus on this. Gentle lady's time has expired. The gentleman from California, Mr. Gallagher, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Dr. Loop, uh, Dulip, uh, when we grant an alien the privilege of immigrating to this country, do you believe that there is an inherent obligation uh, to eventually allow their entire family, uh, uh, extended family, to uh, immigrate? No, I think a country can decide immigration policy, and I, I think that's what's being debated here today. No, I, I just want to get your, your assessment. Do you think that, that uh, uh, granting that privilege, uh, we as a nation, your opinion, have an obligation to uh, uh, allow eventually the entire family to uh, immigrate? I, I don't have a problem with that. So you would support that thesis? Yes. Okay. Uh, Dr. Gingry. Uh, you know, we we heard a lot of numbers bounce around, as we always do, and there's that hypothetical 273 number. Uh, l let's forget about the 273 number uh, just for a minute. Uh, and uh, uh, there's a lot of talk about amnesty. There's a lot of talk about comprehensive immigration reform, another code word for amnesty. Uh, whatever we call it, if we allow 12 to 20 million, depending on what the real numbers are, and none of us really know. But let's say that we accept the fact that somewhere between 12 and 20 million people have no legal right to be in this country. And we are not going to, to do a blanket amnesty, but we're going to find a way to allow them all to stay and find some form of legal status eventually. Let's say we forget about the 273 number, but hypothetically I think it would be very realistic that once they get that status, that they would have probably, in the most conservative way, uh, a, uh, a minimum of probably two per individual that uh, have gained status that would have a family member uh, that would qualify for reunification or sponsorship or whatever. Is that fair? Uh, yes, that's fair. And, and, and really, as I pointed out uh, early, earlier in, in, in talking to Mr. Berman, uh, yes, this is the extreme. This is the extreme situation, but this is Murphy's Law, and we all know what Murphy's but, Law is. The extreme we, can happen. But if we're talking, the 273 is extreme. I think that two, which would be one one-hundredth of that, would be very conservative. Is that a fair assessment? It is. Yeah. Now, if we take the most conservative number of 12 million that are here now and and not even talk about the 20 million, instead of 12 million coming in under a, uh, a new form of uh, uh, immigration reform status, comprehensive amnesty, whatever word you want to use, 
that 12 million translates to a conservative minimum of 36 million. How do we deal with that? How do we reconcile that? With well, without question, uh, Mr. Gallagher, uh, uh, amnesty plus family reunification, as we now interpret it, would, as you point out, lead to a minimum uh, of, of an increase of 12 million uh, to 30 something million. And I think your math is accurate. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, 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 I yield to the gentleman, uh, the ranking member, Mr. King. Thank you, Mr. Gallagher. Um, I had a lingering question uh, for Mr. Anderson, and, uh, and it had to do with um, a statement that I heard in your testimony about immigrants being slightly better educated than native-born Americans. And I think that's been historically true for over a century. Um, but I'd ask you if uh, we provided amnesty or legalized the 12 to 20 million that are here, if you would still be able to make that statement, just speaking about that group of immigrants, would you then uh, would you take the position that the illegals that are here are slightly better educated than the native-born American? No. I mean, that's, that's not the case. I mean, I do think that what, what, what Dr. Gleep talked about, about that once people, and I think there are, is, has been studies on this, that once people gain legal status, they tend to have a much greater incentive to invest in their own skills because they're going to be more likely here for the long term. So I think you would see... Let me ask you, you then, some of that increase, with, with that point in mind, have you studied the rector study that uh, studies the, the households that are headed up by high school dropouts? And I know there's a distinction now between legal and illegal and a slightly different impact, but very negative. Mr. Gingrey referenced that. Have you studied that? that um, I've, I've looked at it. I haven't studied it, so I can't. I don't want to comment on sort of whether it's right or wrong. I mean, uh, is anyone else in the panel taking a look at that study? I, I, I've read it. And do you have any rebuttal you'd like to offer the panel? Well, I, I think the problem of, of poorly educated immigrants can be a problem. I think that's particularly a problem where you have groups where they don't have permanence here, where there's a lot of going back and forth. So I think to address that issue uh, that people who come here legally or illegally, that permanent communities should be encouraged. Thank you, Dr. Dulip. I yield back to you. The gentleman's Dr. time has expired. The gentleman from Massachusetts is recognized for five minutes. I, I thank the chair for the time. Um, a, as I listen um, and, and, and hear the various perspectives here, um, you know, the, the definition of a nuclear family uh, and the kind of change that's being uh, proposed by, uh, by Dr. Gingrey, it could conceivably have an impact on highly skilled immigrants. I would, you know, put forth to all of you and, and, and you too, Phil, um, that determinations to uh, come to this country, particularly if you're a highly skilled worker, uh, could very well be impacted by denying um, an individual uh, the capacity to bring his or her adult children to this country. I mean, am I uh, making it up, or is there? Should we be concerned about that? I mean, we have, you know, time after time, this committee has made decisions based on uh, H-1Bs, high tech, where American corporations have been aggressively and actively soliciting uh, specialized skill. Uh, I think I, for one, uh, if I were, uh, if I had restrictions on whom could come with me and, and who could resettle in this country, I would very well consider opting for employment elsewhere that's available. Well, Mr. Delhunt, if I could respond to that, uh, uh, the, the, the commission, the Jordan Commission, uh, and I quote uh, from that report, a properly regulated system of legal immigration is in the national interest of the United States. Such a system enhances the benefits of immigration while protecting against potential harms. Unless there is a compelling national interest to do otherwise, immigrants should be chosen on the basis of the skills that they contribute to the United States economy. The Commission believes that admission of nuclear family members, spouses, uh, dependent children, uh, and refugees provides such a compelling national interest. Reunification of adult children and siblings of adult citizens solely because of their family relationship is not as compelling. 
in, in, in response well, to your question, all- I would say, uh, Ms. Delahunt, that you are much more likely to get a skilled worker who you know their skills when they apply than, than just take a potluck from a, a family re- reunification, some of whom may be skilled, but many of whom who may, may not be skilled at all. Well, with all due respect to my friend and colleague from, from, from Georgia, I know that if I had any skills at all, uh, and I was living elsewhere, and I had a family um, where the children were uh, of a majority age, and because of the bill uh, that that you put forth, and you denied me the opportunity to bring my family, I'd say, <laughs> forget it. Uh, I, I think we put ourselves in a, in a position where we uh, we lose something. I don't, would any of the other panelists wish yeah. to comment? Yeah, I'm, th- I'm, I'm not sure we want to set our immigration system up to encourage the immigration of somewhat skilled people who don't care about their families. I mean, if that's kind of what we're getting at here. I mean, what we really want to, I mean, I just go back to this again, that all this talk about skilled immigration, the business community employers are not in favor of establishing some new sort of point system or anything like that. They want to have an expansion of the current system they don't want to have a divisive fight over family immigration. And they also believe that once, you know, when executives come here, if their children are over 21, they want them, they, they aren't going to get them here, and you're not going to get some of the investment that might, the foreign investment that might take place if people know that their children aren't going to be able to re- re- Reclaiming my time and going back to my, my, my friend from Georgia, is you indicated 250,000, I think it was in 1975, and a million now, but these are all legal immigrants. Is that correct? Correct. So your problem is you think too many – you think the numbers coming into this country in terms of legal immigrants uh, are of an order of magnitude that, that you know, uh, that we don't need in this country. Well, well correct. And I think the policy of, uh, of, of this family reunification is basically a come one, come all. Uh, my friend uh, uh, Mr. Anderson just said that the employers are, are, are not for us uh, – restricting this to skilled workers, maybe not. Maybe a few of the miscreant employers would love to see more and more unskilled workers well, come so they could pay them low wages. We, 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 again, reclaiming my time, I, I just wonder where our economy would be if we had stayed at that 250,000 figure as opposed to a million legal uh, workers, illegal immigrants coming into this country now and adding to the GDP. Any Professor Hing? Well, Congressman, I, I, I mean, I think that's the debate. You, you, put, you hit the nail right on the head because people would make those decisions to not come, and they wouldn't contribute. There's a reason why the pre- preamble to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights highlights the unity of family as the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace of the world. It's because our families make us whole, and our families define us as human. No, but I, with all due respect, I'm talking about the economic impact. If over the last 25 or 30 years, we did not have the numbers of legal, not illegal or undocumented, but legal immigrants coming into this country to provide an adequate workforce, what would, what would have happened? Can you speculate in terms of our national economy? The gentleman's time has expired. We'll ask Mr. Hing to right. briefly respond. Right. The, the, the number of jobs that have been created, top to bottom, construction workers to high tech, would have been decreased and the amount of investment would have been increased in the United States. The gentleman time his time has expired and uh, all time has expired. Uh, I would uh, like to thank all the witnesses for their testimony today and without objection members will have five legislative days to submit any additional written questions for you which we will forward and ask that you answer as promptly as you can to be made part of the record and without objection the record will remain open for five legislative days for the submission of any other additional materials. Our hearing today has helped to illuminate numerous issues concerning family and immigration reform. This discussion will be very helpful to us as we move forward on comprehensive immigration reform uh, this year. We have learned in this hearing uh, that Family immigrants are part of the entrepreneurial picture of the United States and that the current immigration system actually tracks family as separate from uh, employment-based uh, immigration. We know um, 
that as we move forward, there may be a discussion on whether to merge those two lists in a point system so that family immigration and employment immigration would be instead be in competition with each other for visas, and that is something that this committee and the Congress must consider uh, very carefully. I would like to note also uh, that this, uh, as our eighth hearing, has um, shed much light and I am actually very optimistic that the information that we have learned here will lead us to a bipartisan, comprehensive approach to the issues that face us that make sure that our country continues to prosper economically and uh, culturally and socially. Uh, I would like uh, to extend an invitation to everyone here to attend our next hearings on immigration reform. The minority at our last hearing requested at, under the rules there an additional hearing which will be held tomorrow in this room at 9 a.m. We will have two hearings next week, uh, Tuesday, at May 15th at 9.30 in the morning and again at 2 in the afternoon. We will explore the future of undocumented students and additionally the integration of immigrants into American communities. And with that, this hearing is adjourned.